In the world of power electronics, there is a saying, every percent of efficiency matters. But today, with more and more high power mega trend applications like EV charging, solar, HEV and EV traction inverters, onboard chargers, and motor drive applications coming to market, efficiency is more important than ever before. And that saying just doesn't cut it anymore. Today, it's more like every milli percent of efficiency matters. And the key to that efficiency is gate drivers and switches. And that's exactly what we're talking about today. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Bob Card from On Semi and I investigate the role that gate drivers and switches play in high power mega trend applications. We also explore the benefits that silicon carbide switches bring to these applications, how gate drive is calculated, and how OnSemi is furthering innovation in wideband gap drivers and switches. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from OnSemi. Hi, Bob. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Amelia. Absolutely. So, Bob, today we're talking about pairing gate drive to Elite Sick. But before we dig into the details, can you set the stage for us? What kind of applications and topologies are we talking about here? I'd be happy to, Amelia. So when you look at the uh, silicon carbide for applications, it's really quite wide. It includes solar, EV charging, traction inverters, onboard charging for EV and, and hybrids, motor drive, and also DC to DC, as well as networking server and power supplies. And when you look at the power, there's a bit of a dichotomy between, I don't know, the network sub servers and power supplies is roughly up to 10 kilowatt, probably go a little higher with the network servers. But from 10 kilowatt to 5 megawatt is where you've lumped in these larger applications, these mega trends for solar EV charging and motor drive. And the interesting or irony is when you look at the electronic topologies for all of these applications, up on the top, you'll see uh, three-phase PWM, which is uh, for a motor drive or BLDC motor drive. And you've got a high side and low side switch to control the UV and W windings of the brushless DC motor with three half-bridge gate drivers. And to the top right for solar, you'll see to be able to generate AC to the grid or power your house with AC, you have typically an MCU driving a half-bridge gate driver with an H-bridge, which is four switches and a similar topology down below for uninterruptible power supplies. And at the far bottom for switch mode power supplies and onboard charging, you've got the transformer on the primary side on the left of the transformer and the secondary side on the right of the transformer. The whole point of this slide is, and, and the whole message is, and the elephant in the room is there's just so many gate drivers and switches. So that's the real message behind this slide. All right, so Bob, why is silicon carbide a great option for these kinds of high power mega trend applications? Well, Amelia, if I look at this plot here on the x-axis, I've got the switching speed of these topologies that we just mentioned. And on the y-axis, the power in watts. And getting back to the x-axis, so if, as you move left to right, you have faster switching speeds. And so typically when you have faster switching speeds, the passives in the topologies of the circuits, meaning the transformers, capacitors, and inductors, can be reduced in their physical size and costs, which gives you higher power density. So for the same amount of power, you can generate a power supply or one of these topologies in a much smaller form factor by switching faster. And so you, returning back to the plot, you can see how silicon did a pretty good job from 10 megawatts to switching at about 500 kilohertz. But IGBTs kind of took over from silicon because they do a better job of uh, going to higher power. And then you'll see with these arrows moving left to right for applications like solar, rail, EV charging, motor drive, and so on, the silicon carbide is a superior choice over the IGBTs. And that's because silicon carbide has much better thermal properties and also can switch faster. So it's just a better switch. And then further down below in the plot, you can see uh, GAN or gallium nitride can even switch faster which is a great advantage, but it's still today, you know, 2024, it still doesn't quite have the power that silicon carbide has or IGBTs have. 
So for many of these topologies, silicon carbide is becoming the switch of choice. All right. So efficiency is also an important factor to consider here as well, right? Amelia, yeah, that's, that's a biggie because efficiency is very important. And I'm old enough to remember for like in the old days, a 100 watt power supply at 95% efficiency, which you're doing pretty good. That's a power loss of five watts. So when you're trying to dissipate five watts of power loss in the form of typically of heat, you know, your cooling strategy is pretty straightforward. However, when you move on to these larger energy infrastructure applications like EV charging, energy storage, uninterruptible power sources, and solar, now you're talking hundreds of kilowatts, if not megawatts of power. And, you know, 95% efficiency, which is still good. Now you're talking kilowatts of power, if not tens of kilowatts of power losses that typically dissipate in the form of heat. So that's a much more complicated problem for your cooling strategy. And so the whole point of this is every milli percent matters now when you get into these higher power applications. Now, looking further below for the total power loss, and I've got basically a block diagram here of a controller driving a dual Hapridge silicon carbide gate driver with a high side and low side uh, silicon carbide switches going to the load. The total power losses is the sum of the conduction at a high level, the conduction losses plus the switching losses. Now, if you look at the conduction losses, that's dominated by the RDS on or the resistance of the device when it's fully enhanced or turned on, plus some of the parasitics caused by the packaging. However, switching losses, it's a lot more complicated. You've got the QG or the total gate charge. You've got the QRR or the reverse recovery charge developed by the uh, body diode. You've got the input capacitance, the gate resistance, the E-on and E-off losses collectively all contribute to the switching losses. So the switching losses is a lot more complicated, plus there's some influences with the packaging. Whereas the conduction losses is mainly I squared R, which is the, the resistance times current squared. So Bob, why do we need different gate drivers for MOSFETs, IGBTs, and silicon carbide? Yeah, that's true. You do need different gate drivers for silicon, uh, IGBTs, and silicon carbide because the data sheets of each respective switch dictates that. And so if you zoom out the camera with this slide here, I have the MCU on the far left. At best, it can swing its voltage levels from maybe zero volts to 3.3 volts because there's a lot of pressure on the MCU to have, you know, really high density, a small process nodes and therefore lower voltages. So that's why you need a gate driver to be able to drive either silicon IGBTs or silicon carbide because zero to 3.3 volts doesn't cut it to turn those switches on and off properly. So if you look at a gate driver for silicon, you're going to need to switch from zero to 10 volts, which is a typical uh, 10 volt swing for on and off, switching on and on and off. IGBTs, it's closer to zero to 15 volts. And of course, you always want to, you know, look up the data sheets of the switch you're trying to turn on and off. That'll tell you exactly what you should and shouldn't do. But this is more or less a, uh, a generic summary. And then farther below for silicon carbide, you have a typically a 21 volt swing from minus three volts to 18 volts. And this gives you your best efficiency, your lowest conduction losses, and your lowest switching losses for doing proper gate drive selection. So Bob, can we take a closer look at the gate driving for Elite Sick? Sure. So for gate driving with Elite Sick, you've got this classic uh, view moving left to right on the far left, the MCU driving the gate driver, then driving Elite Sick. In all three examples, I've got Elite Sick. But in the top example, if I have a gate driver that goes from zero to 15 volts, that will functionally work. It'll turn that switch on and off properly and functionally. However, if you just expand that voltage from zero to 15 to zero to 18 volts, that's much better efficiency. Your conduction losses will be reduced by 25%. Your E on losses will be reduced by 25%. And your E off losses will be reduced by approximately 3%. And then to take a step further, if you swing when you turn off, go below zero volts to minus three volts, that's the best efficiency. That lowers your E on losses by about 3% and your E off losses by another 25%. Each one works. But the best efficiency is where you do the full swing, 21 volt swing for silicon carbide from minus three volts to 18 volts. So what I like about this slide is it captures this plot from an apps note we published in January 2023 called AND90204 slash D on the top right. I highly recommend this apps note if you want to get into more 
technical details of how, you know, silicon carbide and gate drivers should be paired and switching silicon carbide. In this particular plot, we've got our 1200 volt M3S silicon carbide power MOSFET. It's a 22 milliohm. And on the x-axis of the plot is the negative gate bias voltage. And on the y-axis of the plot are the switching losses in microjoule. We have two parameters that we're plotting. In blue is the E on losses, but most importantly in orange is the E off losses. And you can see if you churn off at zero volts, you can expect to incur about 350 microjoules of power of switching losses. However, if you churn off at minus three volts, your switching losses goes down to 250 microjoules. So you save approximately 100 microjoules by switching off down to minus three volts versus zero volts. And another added benefit to that is sometimes with this switching really quickly with all this high power, and you have a lot of L's, C's, and R's involved in this in the circuitry, there can be some ringing. You can have a little ringing when you turn off, and the last thing you want to do is accidentally trip the VGS threshold to turn back on again. So going down to minus three volts gives you two benefits. You save on the switching losses captured in this plot, but you also help prevent accidental turn on when you're turning off. So can we also look at the turn on of a MOSFET or a silicon carbide MOSFET? Sure. If you look at the top right-hand part of this slide, I've got a gate driver on the left driving a uh, silicon carbide MOSFET. This applies for a regular MOSFET as well. And you can see that the three terminals, the gate, the drain, and the source of the MOSFET. And I've also captured the capacitances between the gate to source and the gate to drain, as well as the capacitance drain to source in parallel with the body diode. All of those play a role in the turning on and turning off of the MOSFET, silicon carbide MOSFET. And then I've got the green arrows that captures the current flow for the turn on. So we break this turn on into four time states. Time state one is where the VGS or the voltage gate to source goes from zero to the VTH or the threshold of the switch, which is typically 2.7 volts at 25 degrees C. That's when you see the greatest gate drive current at its peak current, but the VDS is still high and the ID isn't flowing yet. It's not until time state two when the gate driver goes through the voltage threshold and now arrives at the Miller plateau of the VGS. The gate drive has dropped a little bit and it's beginning to plateau. The VDS is still high, but now you see that ID is starting to flow. So during time state two, you're going to dissipate a lot of power or switching losses because you've got I times E. Your VDS is still high and the ID is high. The whole goal is to get that ID to flow for turn on with the VDS low. So then we go to time state three and we go through the Miller plateau for the VGS, the gate drive current plateaus, and now that VDS collapses. That's what we want to do. We want to turn that switch on as that ID is flowing more freely. And then we get to time state four, and this is where the VGS reaches its maximum voltage. And this is where the RDS on reaches its minimal value. And the IG is practically zero, the gate drive, and the VDS is fully collapsed. So this, in a nutshell, is a first order high-level view of how to turn on a silicon MOSFET switch. So what about turn off in this case? Right. So for turn off, uh, it's basically the reciprocal. So on the top right, I've got that same sort of schematic of the gate driver on the left driving the, uh, the silicon MOSFET on the right. And uh, I've got red arrows now showing the current flow for the turn off. So we'll go with time state one. For time state one, we, the VGS is maximum. That goes down to the Miller Plateau. The IG instantly peaks and then starts dropping. The VDS is still low and the ID is still flowing. Then time state two, the gate driver goes through the Miller Plateau. The IG is plateaued, but now the VDS starts to climb back up while the ID is flowing. So this is where you're incurring more switching losses because of I times E. And then time state three, you can see that the input voltage of the gate driver, gate voltage, drops to the VTH or the threshold, and the gate drive also drops. The VDS now is high, and now during time state three, the ID starts to collapse, which is what you want for turnoff, till you get to time state four, where the VGS either reaches zero or goes below zero. It could be minus three, minus five volts in that range. And now the IG is practically zero. The VDS is high, and now the ID has stopped flowing. So now the RDS on has reached its maximum value and you fully turn that switch off. So Bob, how is gate drive calculated? 
Uh, sure, I can give you a first order approximation for the gate drive calculation. And the gate drive can be approximated as IG equals the QG total divided by the on off time. The QG total or the total gate charge is the amount of charge in Coulombs that needs to be injected into the gate electrode to turn on the MOSFET fully. So if I look at my handy dandy uh, plot on the far right, and again, this is our M3S 1200 volt, 22 milliohm end channel silicon carbide power MOSFET. I like this plot. It's the gate to source VJS voltage on the Y axis and the QG total on the X axis. And this tells you a lot about how to turn the switch on and off. And so you'll notice on the far left, the uh, VGS swing is 21 volts from minus three to 18 volts. So you can see right there, it does want to be switched below zero volts down to minus three, completely supports that. And then if you look at the VGS threshold, it's approximately 2.72 volts at 25 degrees C at about 18 nanocoulombs. Moving higher up at around seven volts, you'll see the Miller plateau begin around 35 nanocoulombs and continue to about 70 nanocoulombs. And then finally at 140 nanocoulombs for the M3S family of uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs, we reach the lowest RDS on, in this case, typically 22 milliohms, when the VGS reaches 18 volts. And so if I look back to the left at our flagship uh, silicon carbide MOSFET gate driver, the NCP51561 dual channel gate driver, with 5 kV RMS uh, galvanic isolation input to output. This device exhibits a four and a half amp typical source current for switch turn on and a nine amp sync current for switch turn off. If you take that for the, let's say if you want to measure the on time, assuming this gate driver at four and a half amps source current, if you say the gate drive current is 4.24 amps, which is, gives you a little bit of headroom, that's a 33 nanosecond on time, assuming a QG total of 140 nanocoulombs. Now, you always have to be careful that you don't want to switch too fast. You always want to switch as fast as you can to minimize the switching losses. However, if you switch too fast, you can incur a little bit of noise and EMI and accidentally trip the uh, VTH when you're trying to turn off. So it's a balancing act between you want to turn off as fast as you can without turning off too fast, where you might cause some ringing and some EMI, and you might introduce noise or be an aggressor for noise for other nearby circuits. So, Bob, can we talk a bit more about the efficiency relationships here? Sure. I'd like to take a step back and summarize the relationships we've discussed so far with driving Elite Sick with gate drivers. At a high level, if you want to increase your efficiency, then the RDS on should go down because of I squared R, right? You're taking the square of current on I and multiply it by the resistance. So the lower the R, the lower the conduction losses. However, as you lower the RDS on for silicon carbide switches, then the QG total will go up. They're inversely proportionate. And that's the same for the input capacitance, the E on losses, and the E off losses. Again, this will increase your switching losses. So if you have an increase of QG total, then you need more gate drive. However, you got to be a little bit careful it's good to have more gate drive. It's good to switch the silicon carbide switches on and off as quickly as possible, but you need to manage the EMI and the ringing, especially during turn off. So that's more application specific. And that's when you kind of get into the weeds a little bit where, you know, each application is different. And because uh, there's so much current that you're turning on and off and these inductances and, and resistances and capacitances that you need to respect, you know, there's a little bit more engineering involved in there. It's beyond the scope of this presentation. Now, if I look at this table in the bottom right, this shows four of our 1,200-volt uh, Elite 6 M3S 3-lead products. And in the blue column, I've captured the typical RDS-ons. And then there's four columns after that that capture the uh, QG total, the input capacitance and picofarad, the E-on and E-off losses in microjoules. And the point I'm trying to make here is that as that RDS-on goes down, the QG total, the input capacitance, and the E-on losses and the E-off losses go up. These are just captured some of the main relationships for efficiency with respect to driving Elite Sick with the proper gate driver. So we also need to talk about safety here as well, right, Bob? Yeah, safety is always important. And so for relatively low power applications, I'm going to say kind of roughly below two, two and a half kilowatt. And of course, you always want to talk to your customer about this or, you know, it is application dependent, but more or less, this is true. 
when you're driving that, have an MCU driving a gate drive, which is driving the silicon, whether it's a silicon MOSFET or even Elite Sick or, or an IGBT, whatever. For this power levels are typically silicon. You don't really necessarily need isolation input to output. However, when you get to higher power applications, more or less above two and a half kilowatt, for example, with Elite Sick, then it's a good idea to have an isolated gate driver input to output. And we typically use galvanic isolation input to output, which is similar to like a transformer. So what that does is that helps protect the user from safety concerns because it provides that isolation, electrical isolation between the low power domain near the MCU, where the typically user is, is coming close contact with, and then the high power domain on the far right schematically where the elite sick is. So, Bob, what kind of gate driver should I use for SICK? Right. So this brings us to basically the whole crux of this presentation, this webinar, is this uh, table on slide 13, which captures at a first order approximation the gate drivers that we recommend to use with various elite SICK MOSFETs. And I sorted them by breakdown voltage from 650 volts, 750, 900, 1200 and 1700 volts with their corresponding RDS on, typical RDS on. So I'm just moving column by column left to right, and then followed by the packaging. And so I recommend for a single channel gate driver, and this assumes some level of galvanic isolation in the first column case, which is the NCP51752, when there's also a V version for automotive, which is 3.75 kilovolts RMS galvanic isolation. That device has a four and a half amp source current, nine amp sink current. And then to the next column to the right for the one channel, I've got the NCD5709 family. And then to the next column, I've got the NCD, and there's a V version, 5710X family. And further down, I'll explain, go into in a little more details in each one. These three gate drivers are what we recommend for single channel. And then for dual channel or half bridge application, we recommend the NCD V575XX family or the NCP V5156X family. And then the final in the top, the row above that, I have the source and sink currents for each one. So the 575XX family has six and a half amp source and sink current, whereas the uh, 5156X family has four and a half amp, nine amp source and sink current. And then I have a third parameter there, which is either 20 nanoseconds or five nanoseconds, that's the matching or the total propagation delay matching between the two output channels. That's important for a half bridge application. The big no-no with a half bridge application is to turn on the high side and low side switch at the same time. So what helps you mitigate against that, that's called shoot through current, is to have a lower matching number, the worst case matching between the two output channels in terms of propagation delay. So a lower number is better. So that's why the 5156X is our flagship silicon carbide MOSFET gate driver because it's going to extremely low 5 nanosecond maximum total propagation delay matching. And then finally, we have uh, footnotes for each one of these uh, gate drivers in the table. Number one, these are the devices that support external negative bias turnoff. Remember I mentioned that earlier. If you can swing when you turn off and you go below zero volts, that buys you a little bit better, about a 25% better switching losses. Footnote number two supports what's called desaturation or desat. That's overcurrent protection. The gate driver has a, you know, an analog control loop that turns off the device if it sources too much current, if it's got a short circuit current scenario. And then number three is the active Miller clamp protection. This clamps the VGS preventing accidental turn on during intended turn off. And then number four is internal negative bias turn on, which is specific to the 51752. Anytime you see a V, that means we also support the automotive. So long story short is all of these devices are both industrial grade and also automotive qualified. Fantastic. Now, Bob, can we take a closer look at those gate driver solutions from OnSemi? Uh, sure. Let's look at the NCB. The first one is the NCP, and we also have a V version, the 51752. That's our 3.7 kilovolt RMS isolation gate driver. It's a single gate driver. And it's got a typical source current of four and a half amps, typical sink current of nine amps. But what sets this device aside from all the other gate drivers, it's got an integrated mechanism to generate that negative bias to the gate drive loop to offer that safe and better efficient off state. So you don't have to supply that negative voltage to the gate driver as you do for other devices. It's built inside. The next device is the NCD or V 
option 5709X. This has a source and sink current of six and a half amps. It's also a single channel gate driver with 5 kV galvanic isolation. But this also has that uh, active Miller clamp and also supports the external negative power supply for improved efficiency during turnoff. The next single gate driver or the third single gate driver we have is the NCD 57100. We also have a V version and a 57101. And this device sources and sinks seven amps, but it's got a little bit more uh, in terms of diagnostics for the gate driver. So it's got the DSAT diagnostics, the active Miller clamp diagnostics, as well as fault notification to a companion MCU if something occurred that it needs to be known about. It also supports the negative voltage, and this has a 1200 volt working voltage. Now for our dual channel gate driver, the NCDV575XX family, this has a gate charge and sink current of 6.5 amps with 5 kV galvanic isolation with a 1200 volt working voltage. And this is an NSOIC 16 wide body. And this also offers dead time control to be able to help mitigate against the shoot through current where both high side and low side switches or the A output or the B output to ensure that they don't turn on at the same time in any kind of half bridge applications. And then finally, the last device of the table is the NCP also in a V version. The 51561, that's a 5 kV isolated gate drive with four and a half amp source current, nine amp sync current with a 1200 volt working voltage programmable dead time control, but also the match propagation delays of a maximum of five nanoseconds for the two outputs, the A output versus the B output. That highlights the five gate drivers that I put in the tables. So Bob, where do these solutions fit into the overall on-semi isolated gate driver ecosystem? Right. So what we have is a, a whole big family of isolated gate drivers at OnSemi. We're a world leader in silicon carbide gate drivers as well as IGBTs and MOSFETs. And this captures kind of in painful detail, I suppose, all of our isolated gate drivers. And what's highlighted in orange is what I put in the table on slide 13. So it just gives you a little bit of more visibility into what we have. And to that end, I've added a number of columns that also gives more details on how these gate drivers differ and why one might be a better fit for one's application versus another. So what kind of options does OnSemi offer when it comes to EliteSIC? Well, for EliteSIC, OnSemi is a world leader in silicon carbide. We have a lot of different products. And so what I did is I captured all of our silicon carbide switches in the next three slides. In the fourth column, in light orange, I've captured the breakdown voltage and I sorted them by breakdown voltage. So this goes from all of our 650s and then begins the 750 volt at the bottom of the table. The next column is the maximum current. And then the next column in orange are the typical RDS ons at 25 degrees C. And then the next column moving left to right is the QG total, followed by the VGS operating range, followed by the VGS swing in the green column, followed by the VGS at the typical RDS ons that we spec, the VGS thresholds, the output capacitance, the max junction temperatures ratings, all of which are 175 degrees C, which is world class. And then finally, the package type, which you can see in the final column. And then we can continue with the next slide, items 30 through 58, where we have more devices, more silicon carbide devices with 900 volts and 1200 volts breakdown. And then finally, on the third slide, where we capture 1200 volts and then even our 1700 volts products. All right. Well, Bob, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me, Amelia. It was a pleasure, as always. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from OnSemi. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash EE Journal.